this week we're going to be looking at a cattle sale which proves that the prices for good Frisians is still pretty good. We're also going to be talking about rural women and what they're doing to make sure that the wheels are well greased as far as young people coming into the industry. What people are talking about this week is that the drought is getting a lot worse and it's getting longer and longer. We've got more about that on the programme. Stock prices as far as store stock are becoming very high and the questions are being asked about why and still a wait and see regarding the UK leaving the EU. New technology seems to be bursting at the seams daily and the Young Farmer of the Year, we've got more about that and we'll find out who did what shortly on the programme. But in just a moment or two it's going to be animal health, prevention and cure. Can't believe it. We're just about into carving again. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so what what should we be looking for? Yeah. So um, the big the big problem is, uh, or the big the big issue with calf rearing is is obtaining healthy stock, obviously. Um, and I guess we're talking more about remote calf rearing um, enterprises, remote from the from the parent farm, which uh, seems to be an in, a little industry in its own right, and um, incorporates a lot of little uh, lifestyle. Um, farmers and things as well, so pretty popular, especially around the, the kind of Canterbury area at the moment. You're talking about sourcing, so you're, I'm assuming you're bringing stock in. Exactly. So if you're buying, if you've got a good source of healthy calves, um, stick with it. It's who you know, someone you can trust. Try and minimise the number of properties that you're buying stock from. So if there is any problems, you're only buying one, one properties problems in at a time. <laughs> and you probably know what those problems are. Exactly, hopefully. And also, um, hopefully those animals are going to have some inherent immunity to any infectious kind of conditions, which are the biggies when we talk about uh, problems with calf rearing. Before we go any further, remember the new rules about transporting? Exactly. So um, one of the other big issues with sourcing healthy calves is ensuring that they've had a adequate colostrum intake initially. That, that's the first milk, of course, for anyone who, who's not really a fay with, uh, with, with the industry and what happens. Um, and with that, that first milk, there's a lot of antibodies that are absorbed and give protection to the animal over the first six to eight weeks of life. Um, and so adequate colostrum intake is, is essential. And the new welfare uh, code that's come come about, particularly aimed at at uh, bobby calves, uh, sort of helps it helps out a bit in that regard. There's legal premise that that adequate mm, colostrum mm. intake must be must must have been uh, must have must been have had. Yep. Yeah. Is it wise to mix different different herds? No, because as I've said, um, there could be different infectious problems cycling or endemic in in every in every parent farm, and so. If, for instance, you're buying some calves from one property that doesn't have the same disease as you're buying from another, then of course those calves are not going to have the immunity because there's been no exposure or no colostrum intake from animals that have been exposed to those bugs. It makes them very, very susceptible to disease. And so when you start bringing them and mixing them all together, it's a, just a recipe for getting scours in particular yeah. infectious diseases. So keep diseases. them isolated. Absolutely, or minimise the sources that you're getting them from. So if you've got one, preferably, or maybe two really good trustworthy sources that you've got calves from year, year after year and you know they're looking after their calves well, well that's the way to go really. Now, age isolation, do you keep them at different age groups? Yep, you should say that the, the, best, way, the best way of rearing calves is to keep them in a, in a restricted age bracket and that really is because Certain diseases, when we're looking at problems in groups of calves, uh, seem to be more prevalent in certain age groups. And so um, by mixing perhaps young calves with older calves that may already be immune to some of the problems that we get with younger calves and still might be shedding some of these bugs without showing the effects of it, obviously younger calves coming up and put in the same group are going to be very susceptible and there's going to be lots of those organisms in the environment. And so a... You know, a group coming into a system and exiting at the same time and keeping very even weight is is a really good thing. And if we're getting if we're getting disparity in growth rates, it, it can be very very tempting to hold animals back and um, 
pit them with maybe some of the animals growing up behind them. And that's when, if that happens to a large degree, that's when we can get real problems with admixing of age groups. So, um, you know, I think people need to think very carefully before they start shunting shunting poor <laughs> doers around the place. Perhaps it's a better idea to have an isolation facility or a semi-isolation facility for these poor doers so you're taking them out of the main group and giving them some preferential treatment rather than chucking them back in a healthy group coming up behind them. Right. Hygiene, it's the word. Per, yeah, absolutely. So there's a, it's, it's the biggie when it comes to, um, to good disease control. Um, obviously we just don't want uh, milk, old stale milk and faeces and urine stained flooring and things that can breed up uh, infectious, infectious bugs. As I've said, the biggest infectious problem or the biggest disease problem on the whole with calf rearing is scours or diarrhoea bugs. And of course, it doesn't take a, a genius to understand that if we've got festering feed and body waste in the environment, then we can get high, high numbers of these infectious organisms and obviously exposed to the to the calves. So yeah, hygiene is, is particularly, particularly important, as is adequate flooring so we want good drainage of flooring so a nice dry surface on the top and easy to clean out thoroughly and also a thorough <coughs> decontamination after animals are moved on so that any <coughs> any uh, bugs that have that have come up in population in that environment can be easily killed so a good thorough viricide and disinfectant um, of all surfaces after uh, animals have left the facility before new ones come in is very, very important. Nick, thank you very much indeed. And yeah, there's a lot of work to be done in the next few months. Yeah. In just a moment, Dave Dunlay is going to be talking about a cattle sale and the prices were very good. Where have the cows come from? Uh, most of the cows have come from here in Canterbury. It's a sale that we have run ourselves since the last conference uh, 11 years ago. So mainly it's just uh, us breeders that come together and put each, each put it in a few and just sell them like that. Um, we've had one from, uh, we've had three from Hamilton, from two vendors. And the further south this year is uh, Timaru. And sometimes we get them even further south, but this year it's just, it's just the ones from Timaru, which is also included in our area, our branch. With the drought, it's been a hard year. Um, what's the standard like this year? Uh, it's actually, I, I described it as the best sale we've ever had for standard. Just uh, looking at the pedigrees, um, there's international pedigrees, there's pedigrees of cows that have just made their name here in, in Canterbury and around the country. Um, lots of old pedigrees that are coming back through again. The families are sort of coming back through with some good offspring. But um, yeah, it's just been... I've thought it was extraordinary. How strong is demand? Are there many selling off cows? Yeah, we have. It's been really good. There's been um, uh, quite a few over 10,000, which is awesome. Um, there's not many selling like that at the moment. Obviously, with the milk price, it hurts everyone quite a bit. There's been an uh, odd few that haven't gone for what we th thought they might, but we're Overall, we're really happy. Um, the average will come out soon, and I'm expecting good things. Tell us, what are the buyers looking for? Um, mostly at our sale, they're looking for show type, which is how good they'd do at a show. There's some here that are here for production and other sorts of things, but mainly it's just for the fancy show cows um, to go and win in a show ring. The, the money that they're getting, it's not really, they're not going to pay themselves back with production. It's mainly for what you'd call the sport of showing. So that's mainly where the, the money comes from. And for those who want to show their cows, what are the judges looking for? Um, mainly you're looking for dairiness, which is a nice clean bone. You don't want a fat dairy cow. She's not going to make your money. You want all of the, all of the energy put into, as a young animal, growing. And then um, when she's in milk, uh, making milk. And that's basically what you want from a dairy cow. Other than that, there's all functional traits um, that you want. You want sort of big, um, deep-bodied, long animals that they can eat a lot of food and process a lot of food to make milk. There's all sorts of things that we look for that have um, reasons behind why we're looking for them. It's not just random things we come up with. There's reasons behind everything we look for to try get the cows to make the most milk, to get in calf every year and to be the most productive cow they can be. 
And this is a pretty unique venue. Normally it's weddings here. Tell us about the venue. It is. Um, weddings and funerals is what they cater to mostly, but um, the very first year we had it in the Grand Ballroom at the Chateau on the Park Hotel in the middle of Christchurch. So anything after that, you go to the venue owners and say we've had it there and they're usually pretty calm after that. But um, it's the first time we've had it here. We usually have it at Rickerton Racecourse in one of the rooms they have there, but um, I'm very happy with the venue and the, the owners here seem to be really good. They used to be dairy farmers, so that's, that helps. They, um, but everything seems to have gone really well and I'm really happy with how it's gone. Nice to see so much positivity as far as the Frisian Holstein is a concern. Straight after the break though, we're going to be talking young farmers and finding out who did what on the night. Be Active begins here in the cold, clean, unpolluted Southern Oceans of New Zealand. Be Active Amino Acid Biostimulant. Natural, 100% pure. Manufactured from healthy deep sea fish from sustainable New Zealand fisheries. New Zealand's Be Active Amino Acid Biostimulant. The way the world is growing. Working with nature. Good for the plant. Good for the planet. Now that's growing for good. We're living on a planet facing almost insurmountable challenges. Challenges we have to face sooner rather than later. The world needs our energy. She needs our ideas, our passion. It's up to us to change things, make a positive change to the planet, to feed the world, to protect the future, to live well, to be the generation that will make a change. Join us. You know that saying, content is king? Well, in today's mixed media world, it's true. You need video, audio, photos and more for social media, for marketing, for communications, sales and for advertising. And you need this at a price that works with your budgets. Well, that's what we do. At Tandem, we partner with you to create the content that you can use to shout to the world or video link to a few. Connect with us and we'll help you connect to the world. Terry, it's exhausting but you're through it. <laughs> yeah, grand final was amazing. Yeah. Just amazing. It's about a three day event. Yep, it, um, yeah we do, we start on the Thursday, finished on the Saturday night, so six o'clock in the morning on the uh, Thursday morning, we're up at an at it at um, Raincliffe Station doing the technical day, yep. and uh, that's an amazing place. I don't know if you've ever been out there with the larger deer stations with the uh, wapiti uh, elk, and um, yeah, doing all sorts of technical based um, you know, nutrient plan exam uh, in, in exam conditions and all sorts of things. So, and then you do the practical day, and that's, that's wearing thermals, I would have thought. Yeah, Caroline Bay was pretty cold. <laughs> I had a bit of a sea breeze come in, uh, and it rained a little bit on the, on the Friday. Um, we also had our AgriKids and Teen Ag uh, events and grand finals running alongside the Young Farmer of the Year, which is really good to see them you know, all in a line. Uh, and then Saturday, there was a whole range of events that didn't really count for points, but uh, culminating in announcing our winners, so... Yeah, pretty awesome. Well, everybody's on the edge of the seats, so who's who's won? <coughs> well, for the... We start, start with the AgriKids. Yeah, yeah, so AgriKids were uh, three girls, which is awesome to see, <coughs> uh, from Tanui School uh, in the South Wairarapa. Uh, and they're, they're just amazing little girls, actually. They uh, The passion and excitement. In fact, all the AgriKids, it's really amazing to see already, you can see this competitiveness and desire. We're going to see in the, in the future of young farmers, we're going to see some amazing people come through. Which is exciting. It is. Then uh, a pair of brothers uh, from Rathkeel College uh, in Masterton, so two wire wrapper uh, winners. Uh, they came through pretty strongly, actually. And uh, yeah, their parents in the audience, uh, on, we had an award ceremony, especially for AgriKids and Teen Ag on the Friday night. And yeah, very proud parents. Uh, I'd imagine the, the going home was uh, pretty exciting for that family. Yeah, exactly. But this is really the growth, the depth, isn't it, that you're, you're getting now and making farming sexy. Yeah, absolutely. And, and from a FMG Young Farmer of the Year point of view, what we're seeing now is these teen ag competitors in their teens queuing up and entering district finals, uh, putting themselves against the, the big boys. 
Really? Yeah, already. So <clears> it won't <throat> be long till we see someone in their early 20s win this thing. I've got to congratulate you because seriously, you're going to go humble on me, I know <laughs> that. But when you took over as CEO, people were going, oh, young, young farmers. And now all of a sudden you've turned it right round and, and it's, it's, it's a must do. Yeah, so I, I guess for my journey with young farmers, it's around communicating the, the, the vision of where we want to head as an organisation to everyone and get that buy-in. And yet, look, there's plenty of young farmer clubs out there that have a great time socialising. I mean, I was out till three o'clock in the morning on the Friday night with young farmer members. And then you had the Saturday. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> However, there's a real turnaround in terms of desire to make a real difference. We're getting more people signing up to do leadership type uh, programmes with us. Um, we want to make a real impact uh, on the next iteration of what our rural economy looks like. And I think we've got quite a vital part to play. And the school engagement, that's our big change really, is putting a lot of resource into converting ideas of young people into, oh yeah, I could fit into this. And it's not just rural schools, is it? Exactly. Um, there's not enough kids in rural schools to do all the jobs. If we just concentrate in our heartland, um, we're going to sell ourselves short. So we've got to get that message out to, to Auckland schools in particular, but urban in general. Because of the adaptability, the, the huge range of jobs. Oh, absolutely. And a lot of these jobs haven't been invented, but the technology coming into our industry, we're going to need technologists, we're going to need scientists, we're going to need marketers, engineers. Accountants who can specialise. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. Right, tell us about the, about the night and the seniors. <laughs> yes, yeah, so for the FMG Young Farmer of the Year, it was absolutely amazing. We changed the format of the events this year where the Saturday night, rather than having the quiz element that sort of dominates the Saturday night, we took that out into a separate event on the, on the Thursday night and didn't tell people who won that even. So by the time we get to Saturday, everyone's in the dark. It gets built up during the evening. We have five challenges that make up uh, the FMG Young Farmer of the Year. And we got to all the challenge awards, and uh, four people won the five awards. Really? Wow, well, okay, this is wide open. And then someone came through who won none of them, but came second in four of them, came through and won uh, the FMG Young Farmer of the Year, and that's Athel New from Arangi. So that's the second time in a row for Mid Canterbury. Absolutely, and it's really cool to see um, this chap. He, Athel, is uh, a farm manager. Uh, for Parata Farms that supply Sinlay in, in Canterbury. Yep. Uh, he has 10 staff, so it's a pretty big farm he looks after. Um, and a really humble ex-city kid. Uh, oh, Quite fearless. Yeah, he, yeah. he was brought up in Whangarei and um, yeah, sort of fell into farming by mistake rather than by design. Loves it <coughs> and uh, yes, has all the, the attributes that we want as an ambassador for young farmers. You know, he... he it works as a farmer, but doesn't have those roots. And he's dairying again. Yes. It's going to be hard to knock these dairy farmers off, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, although there were actually more sheep and beef farmers in the grand final this year than dairy. But uh, yes, the way it washed out, uh, dairy picked up uh, one and two. Well, congratulations to all involved. You'll be you'll be catching up on some sleep now. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> oh, and it's a very happy birthday. Oh, thanks very much. <laughs> Terry, cheers. In just a moment, we're going to be talking about irrigation. In fact, it will bit of information about the Irrigation Conference. Gentlemen, the Irrigation Conference in Omaru, how did it go? Very well, yeah. It's, um, irrigation is uh, coming of age, I think, in recognition of uh, the things that have been promoted in terms of efficiencies and um, responsible water use. Efficiency would have been one of the highlights? Oh, absolutely. And we we're very lucky to have an opportunity to talk pre-conference uh, to a number of people about some of those things. I mean, obviously, we want the water to go as far as we possibly can as a society and as a country. Um, and some of the things that are occurring in a lot of these areas are very, very good at uh, creating those efficiencies. Tony, we automatically think about big centre pivots, but that's not necessarily the case. No, I mean, uh, I think uh, we've been... Uh, promoting the G-Set now for some time and, and uh, learning quite a lot um, and uh, we have uh, in the G-Set irrigation um, the ultimate uh, variable rate irrigation system and uh, very suitable for uh, terrain that uh, Pivot is not so suitable for. So um, 
the uh, um, the focus on efficiencies has led us down a path where um, on what would have been traditionally uh, land that you wouldn't consider for irrigation, uh, we're now getting excellent results. Phil, is this because the schemes have been expanding? Yeah, um, actually, and especially around Omaru where the conference was held, um, you have the Hunter Downs, which has been extended, and you have the North Otago Irrigation um, NOIC scheme also being extended uh, considerable distances and huge amounts of, of land that's actually becoming irrigable. Um, but a lot of that land, when you look at the topography, is uh, challenging at best, uh, difficult at worst, um, and obviously it requires specific solutions to actually get the right outcome on. And Tony, centre pivots really don't go up hills very well, do they? Uh, no, particularly the steeper stuff. Um, it depends on whether you're a centre pivot salesman or not, of course. Um, but uh, it, um, it's very tough on... on um, anything mechanical, climbing up and down and in, in variable angles and uh, um, but a lot of um, uh, the, the land that we're now fully irrigating um, you cannot ride a four wheeler on it let alone a, a centre pivot. How do you stop runoff? Uh, by putting on very small amounts of water, amounts of water that the plant is capable of, of uh, grabbing basically. So that means some pretty clever designs? Yeah it does. Um, it means that in fact we've we've got to select the right sprinkler and uh, so we're um, organising the layout such that we're getting as much coverage as we are able uh, without going wild on too many sprinklers per hectare. So it's a real challenge we're trying to trade off uh, that coverage against capital cost because we know that from a farming sense you know, we're, we're trying to get the best outcome. Um, so we're applying a small amount of uh, application depth. We're doing it, uh, in lots of cases, on a single day return. So an entire property we will fully irrigate in one day. Um, that means that uh, we can apply irrigation to deficit. Now what that practically means is that when a rainfall event occurs, we're actually allowing the capability of the soil to absorb that moisture. Now in the past what would have happened is that everybody would irrigate to field capacity. So the soil's topped up, it's full, so the rain event actually just runs off as runoff. Uh, and those are the things that we're trying to avoid with a lot of the solid set systems that are going in there. Now talking about four wheel access and things, what sort of problems does that cause when it comes to insulation? Uh, it's always a challenge, and the steeper it gets, the uh, the more challenging it gets. Um, and um, in some respects, yeah, the more careful you need to be. But uh, luckily, uh, for the type of equipment that's being used on the installation, it's it's designed um, to handle these conditions. So um, it uh, it doesn't appear to be too much of a problem. Um, albeit it takes a little bit longer um, if it, it's not easily driven over country but um, uh, it all comes down to the design and layout and preparation. I guess water doesn't go uphill very well so getting the actual water to the G sets? Uh, absolutely um, and really every, every uh, lift that you have to do of the water is going to cost you more running, running cost. Um, you're going to have to pump those systems uphill. Um, we are careful about what we select in terms of the sprinkler so that in fact we're trying to minimise the amount of pressure that they need to operate. Um, and we believe that the sprinkler selection that we've got in GZ is probably really at the best of, of what's available. Being a plastic sprinkler, it actually operates at a much lower pressure as compared to uh, brass or aluminium, which have much higher head requirements. Um, so we're minimising that as we go. But it doesn't really matter what irrigation system you choose, you're still going to have to lift it. It's just a matter of how far. And Tony, finally, I guess it really does come down to the design. Uh, yeah, I mean, all of the uh, uh, gains and benefits are, are made 
prior to installation and getting the design right, getting the layout right, um, and uh, and then ensuring that the installation um, meets the requirement. Um, we've we've learned uh, um, that there's not one thing you can uh, rely on to get the right result. Um, we need a combination of uh, technology such as uh, GPS um, and a little bit of uh, uh, common sense. Um, 40 metres between two uh, given points might not be 40 metres, so um, it's uh, important that uh, um, people are, are capable of making those um, assessments at the time of installation to meet the desired uh, design. And Phil, it is very exciting, isn't it? Because now it seems as though there's no land that can't go under irrigation. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And in fact, we are poised waiting for this. I mean, we've, we've put a lot of effort into uh, creating, uh, first of all, control systems to uh, actually look after it. And we've done a lot of design work. Um, no, I'm really looking forward to this season. I think it's exciting. And we'll be talking to Tony Daverin about irrigation shortly on the programme. In just a moment, though, we're going to be talking about rural women and making people feel welcome. We're living on a planet facing almost insurmountable challenges. Challenges we have to face sooner rather than later. The world needs our energy. She needs our ideas, our passion. It's up to us to change things. Make a positive change to the planet, to feed the world, to protect the future, to live well, to be the generation that will make a change. Join us. Everybody has a story to tell. What's yours? Maybe your family has been farming the land for five generations. Perhaps you have invented the next best thing in agriculture, or maybe something else. Whatever your story, if you're out on the land, we want to hear from you. Get in touch by emailing us at info at ontheland.co.nz. Be Active begins here, in the cold, clean, unpolluted southern oceans of New Zealand. Be Active Amino Acid Biostimulant, natural, 100% pure, manufactured from healthy deep sea fish from sustainable New Zealand fisheries. New Zealand's Be Active Amino Acid Biostimulant, the way the world is growing. Working with nature, good for the plant, good for the planet. Now that's growing for good. migrants coming into New Zealand, mainly I guess with the, with the dairy industry, that can be pretty lonely if, if they don't get welcomed right. It can be a really lonely world for them actually. They've usually left family, friends, loved ones, gone into debt to get there and they come and it's just, whoa, this is very different, very scary. And a lot of them don't have many skills, I would imagine, like riding motorbikes through mud. and. Yeah, it can be very challenging but very rewarding once you get through those first issues. Rural Women New Zealand, you're, you're doing the Murray Basin area because you're, you're working in Colverton, you live in Colverton. Yeah. Yep. Uh, what sort of things are you guys doing? Um, we're doing lots of things. We've developed, between myself and Alex Thompson, another member, we've developed this welcome pack for new people to the area, one for immigrants and the other one just for normal everyday people that want to know where the ATM is how to get enrolled at the school, that sort of thing. Yeah, was well, so you don't think about that. No, no, you don't. But uh, coming into a Murray myself, I found myself very lonely and very lost. And um, so when we were asked to look at this, we grabbed it with both hands and thought we can do great things with it. So Alex and I got stuck in and we further develop it each year when things come up. So you came from where? North of Auckland. So I'm a migrant too. <laughs> yes, you are really. And you, you've had a business relationship or business before then? Yes, I had um, my husband and I dairy farmed in Walkworth and I also had a day spa in, right in Auckland. So it was a very different life coming from 70 hours with lots of lovely ladies around me to the farm. 
So 140 very... miles an hour to about two to walking space. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How do how do you contact these people? The migrants. Mm. Um, basically, they come to us. Well, the, particularly the Filipinos have a great, great community network, and so through them we know who's coming and who's going and who needs help. And um, so we put this book, uh, this package out that gives all sorts of information and part of those things are numbers that you can contact. So you, you contact Stella if you want some secondhand clothes because she knows where to find all them. We also, if we've got coats that we don't need anymore or heaters, they'll go her way and she'll make sure they're... So it's a network of people really that just keep in contact with everyone. We also have a welcome event at the start of every dairy season and at that, hopefully, a lot of the new people to the area will come. We have a potluck dinner. The P Filipinos put on some games and we have a great night. It's a lot of fun, yeah. Because it, it's, you're right, the Filipino will have their own community. Very to much. To a degree. Yeah. But there's other people who have come, I mean, share milkers and things who have come into yeah. the district. Yeah, so we send out to all of them asking them to come. We publish it in our local newsletters and say, come along to this welcome event and meet us all and hopefully lots of employers will go and lots of you know, long-term residents um, and we all get together and meet each other. It's, it's great. So, so you're, really, you're building up your own community in Murray. We are, yeah. We've also just started this year with a share milker dinner and we went round and got sponsorship and so it was a free dinner for share milkers and contract milkers because it's been a really tough time this year for dairy farmers in our area, or every area, but mm, mm. we're supporting our area. And again, just a time to come along and chat and meet other people in the area and realise you're not alone. So another great night. And I guess it's sports clubs, introducing people to sports clubs. All of that's in the welcome pack. If you want to play rugby, you can find out who to contact in here. Um, churches, that's all listed just any of those things to make people feel like they're part of the community. We're also lucky enough in Amuri to have a community connector. So she's just a new role that um, MSD money's paying for and also a lot of us personally put money into it. And she does a lot of these things too. If she hears so-and-so's moved in there, she'll pop over and see them and say, what do you need? And then she'll come back to me and say, Sharon, this person needs support in this area. And See, that's, that's, it. that's pretty vital, really. It's really vital. Because really you vital. get somebody who, I would imagine, who's lonely, who doesn't mix very well, and depression hits and starts to... Very and easily. Got a trouble. And particularly um, women in the area, um, a, lot of, a lot of the new migrants don't drive, the ladies, and so they're really stuck at home, and we have to make sure that we support them particularly. And as rural women, we, that's what we do really well, so... And a lot of the men wouldn't wouldn't have a car. No, not not in the first instance. No, um, they usually come with nothing. Now, Filipino family came. Mum came first, and um, she had very little with her, and went into great debt to get here. And then husband and the three kids followed a few months later, and they arrived with one suitcase and a banana box for three children and dad. And they come from hot weather to. To Colverton. To Colverton. <laughs> <laughs> Sharon, thank you very much indeed. In just a moment, we're going to be having a look at Brexit and see what people are thinking about what may or may not happen to whom. You're new to our shores. Let's have a look at from whence you've come. What's happening in the UK? Well, as people are probably aware, uh, there is quite a lot happening in terms of the Brexit and the decision by the uh, UK uh, to leave Europe. Obviously that has to go through Parliament and then uh, the UK has to notify the EU that it will uh, be leaving but I assume that will happen at some point and then there'll be years of negotiation and we will see what, what happens. What's likely to happen as far as the farmer community is concerned in the UK and Europe? Most commentators think that because we import uh, quite a lot of our food, so we import uh, more than 30% of our food and more than, and most of that is uh, linked more to the fresh produce sector, 
that we will see uh, food prices increase uh, for the general consumer and diets change uh, perhaps for the worse. For the farming community, which is currently part of the EU's common agricultural policy, uh, farmers receive uh, direct income payments under what is called Pillar 1 and rural development environment type payments under Pillar 2. What we think will happen is that uh, over time some of that Pillar 1 money will uh, decline. We think that the UK government will continue to support farmers with some form of Pillar 1 type money. Uh, they won't withdraw subsidies immediately like happened here in New Zealand back in the 1980s. But the direct income payments will fall um, and we think more money will stay within the rural development environment side of things. So that will still be supported. But we don't know. We're likely to see people in the UK going back to production of land that's not in production at the moment? I would think possibly not. Um, there is a reason why it's not in production. Um, it's not competitive to do so. And if we don't have the market for the products, uh, there would be no reason to be producing them. But you're saying that um, there's a lot of food being imported? Uh, the food that is imported, quite a lot of it, is uh, products that we can't grow ourselves. So we're 100%, for example, self-sufficient in, in milk. Uh, we import a variety of cheese products that we don't produce our, ourselves, so what we call continental cheeses, for example. In terms of uh, the grain side of things and the um, sheep, we're, again, uh, self-sufficient in that to some extent. Uh, what we do tend to import is uh, the pig meat. Um, from Europe, so whether we'll see an increase in the, in the pig sector, um, that might be one possibility. So obviously the new regime, whoever they may be, uh, will obviously be negotiating with the EU countries? Yes, so um, there are various scenarios uh, we could look at. In terms of uh, trade with the EU, uh, the initial suggestion is that um, the EU will not be doing any favours uh, to the UK. Um, so they can have uh, a number of agreements. One of the agreements would give them essentially um, free trade in sort of labour and capital and that side of things. I think it would be similar to Norway, but there is no free trade in food. Uh, a similar situation to Switzerland is um, some free trade, but again, not within the food sector. They could have something similar to the United States, where there is no free trade and they're essentially under the World Trade Organization type agreement. So the trade issue is probably one of the biggest uh, things that uh, whoever is in charge in September has to deal with and the trade in food is going to be the important one. And the UK will have to negotiate um, with the European Union on this and every single member state that is still left in the European Union will have to agree to whatever um, comes out. Tricky times, obviously, but does that open the door for New Zealand? So obviously, um, with the current devaluation of, of, of the pound, um, it does mean for um, UK exports, they are perhaps somewhat cheaper on the, on the market, but for sort of uh, products from New Zealand going the other way, they are slightly more expensive now. So there is uh, potential in terms of uh, negotiating trade, but the initial uh, situation is one of um, increased costs to the UK consumer of New Zealand products. Now, where does the little red tractor fit in? Okay, so the red tractor is uh, essentially a farm assurance tool. So it is saying that uh, food is produced to a certain standard. It's over and above what was the EU hygiene and food safety legislation. And it was a tool for marketing uh, quality assurance to the UK consumer. It can be applied to products outside of the UK. Uh, the difference is that if the red tractor also has a UK flag on it, it means that it's uh, um, produced in the UK or processed in the UK. So there's a little bit of um, 
tweaking on whether it is actually UK produced. But there is a sort of marketing um, of, uh, for example, uh, Scottish beef, Welsh lamb. So they tend to sort of do the devolved administrations in terms of the marketing. So really, it's a case of watch and see. It is just a case of watch and see. Interesting times. Indeed they are, and Theresa May has become the Prime Minister by now, but she's got her work cut out, I think. After the break, we're going to be talking about irrigation, the need for it, and how deep the problem really is. Everybody has a story to tell. What's yours? Maybe your family has been farming the land for five generations. Perhaps you have invented the next best thing in agriculture, or maybe something else. Whatever your story, if you're out on the land, we want to hear from you. Get in touch by emailing us at info at onthelandco.nz. You know that saying, content is king? Well, in today's mixed media world, it's true. You need video, audio, photos and more for social media, for marketing, for communications, sales and for advertising. And you need this at a price that works with your budgets. Well, that's what we do. At Tandem, we partner with you to create the content that you can use to shout to the world or video link to a few. Connect with us and we'll help you connect to the world. Be Active begins here in the cold, clean, unpolluted southern oceans of New Zealand. Be Active amino acid biostimulant. Natural, 100% pure. Manufactured from healthy deep sea fish from sustainable New Zealand fisheries. New Zealand's Be Active amino acid biostimulant. The way the world is growing. Working with nature, good for the plant good for the planet. Now that's growing for good. We're living on a planet facing almost insurmountable challenges. Challenges we have to face sooner rather than later. The world needs our energy. She needs our ideas, our passion. It's up to us to change things, make a positive change to the planet, to feed the world, to protect the future, to live well, to be the generation that will make a change. Join us. Your family's been milking cows now for a long time. Yeah, yeah, we've been here since, I guess the stud was first established in 1953. So we've been here, yeah, ever since then, milking cows and with uh, Granny was milking the first ones by hand and then Granddad built a few sheds and Dad and now me. <laughs> what sort of numbers are you carrying? Uh, we peak milk about 380 through the spring um, and then we do 250, 240 through winter. Um, it sort of varies on the season really with the winter milkers. If it gets really wet in June we tend to dry a big stack off in June and get down to that 200 mark um, for our winter quota. But then if the weather's pretty good, we tend to hold them through till we need to dry them off, really. We carve all year round, so it's, they just come and go as we need them, really, yeah. Now you've consolidated because you used to have two farms. Yeah, we were originally two farms. Granddad had two farms. Um, we had that for, oh, 10, 20 years, I suppose. And then the second farm we sold up uh, five years ago and um, came back to one farm. It was getting too hard to sort of run to and with staff and bits and pieces how they were going, it was easier to concentrate on one and try and get one going really well. So, Milking all year round, are you using your feed pad? Yeah, we use a, um, it's called a herd home. So it's got, um, we feed around the outside and then it's got grating through the centre. So the effluent all falls through the centre and we can capture it all and then we uh, put it back on the paddock sort of in the spring and autumn and then replenish it just when the, when the weather's good really, get it back out there. Do the cows enjoy it? Oh, they love it. They love being in the herd home though. They feed in there, what, from March through till September, and then they stay in there a little bit longer through winter when it's wet. But um, yeah, we, we put them out in the paddock at nights, but 
leave the gates open and they come back if it starts raining. So, I notice there's about three that aren't sitting down. <laughs> yeah, they, they get fed in the morning. I feed them about half past six in the morning after milking and um, they get led out to the paddock after everyone's had breakfast, so about nine o'clock. And within about an hour, everything's sitting down and resting and happy and they chill out for the rest of the day and don't really eat any grass and then, yeah, come back in when it's milking time in the afternoon. The stud started in 1953. Yeah, first started, um, Grandad brought a cow from the neighbour, actually, straight across there. And um, that was sort of how we originally started and um, he built up the cows through his time and then, yeah, we've continued on with the same, really. Just breeding good Holston Frisian cows. Now, all these are registered. Why doesn't everybody do this? Hard to say really, like it's, for us it's, we love the cows, like we love Holstein Frisians, it's what we want, so we've always registered it and always will, but I guess some people probably don't see the, the profit in it, but for us we do. And it's a passion. It is. <laughs> it really is, like we're, we're a little bit crazy on it I suppose, but we do shows and, and sales and and conferences and all sorts of events to do with them so yeah. What's a commercial person looking for when they come to buy a cow from you? Uh, generally if they come to us they want the Holstein Frisian cow and which is what you know our pedigree cow so we've got them um, I guess we've got the type and the production traits that they want so we've got the big framey open cows with the good feet and legs and good udder attachments so to which helps you know the cows stay in the herd for longer so we've got cows that oh we've milked them up till 17 years of age you know instead of this high turnover we try and you know milk them for a long time and <laughs> saves having to rear so many cows if you can keep them going for longer. As far as the bloodlines are concerned where are you getting your sires from? Uh, we're using pretty much Canadian North American genetics we have done ever since I remember um, never used anything really from New Zealand we use a bit of our own I suppose but that's from the same bloodlines but yeah, everything we get is from over there so, uh, and it's selected on the type, production and functionality traits of them. It's interesting you keep talking about type rather than production. Uh, it's, I always like a nice cow. It, to me, it's got to look nice, you know, to be worth getting up in the morning to milk. So, you know, you've got to want to get up and milk them. So I, I like the big open cows with the, you know, good strong traits um, that walk well, that can handle you know, all the different sort of, I guess, effects of winter and, and summer that we have in here. You know, we're, we're quite a wet farm. We can get quite wet through the winter and um, they've sort of got to be able to cope with that. And I guess the big cows are a bit harder, but that's why we have a feed pad, so. And of course, there'll be clients of yours pretty well spread around the country. <laughs> yeah, they have. We've got cows um, in the North Island and Southland. Um, we sell them yeah, all, all year round, we have people sort of come through and pick and buy cows and we rear every heifer that we have and um, take them the whole way through and then pretty much sell them from then on so we have people come in as calves and calf heifers and we carve, I guess we end up by carving about 82 year olds but only keep sort of 40 or 50 so we just sell them as they come in, people come and select the ones they want and yeah, we sell them if they're not the ones we want. So you actually keep the cream? Yeah, we try to, we try to, but we do try to sell our best at the right sales as well, because if you can, you know, your better ones are your best advertising really, if you get them out there and they do well for someone else, then it, it comes back to your good. So we do try and sell some good ones as well. Tony, we're into July and still very little hope. Uh, yeah, we are into into July. You know, we're we're sort of pushing towards the middle of July, and uh, we've got we've had virtually no uh, rainfall recharge to the groundwater system in in Canterbury, particularly the area north of the Rangitata River, and all the way up into the Colverton Basin. We we we're really behind the eight ball uh, when it comes to uh, the rainfall recharge, which is what is the is the key. Um, driver of getting groundwater levels up so that we've got water available um, for irrigation in the in the come in the in the next in the next irrig. How's the North Island faring? Ah, uh, the the area that was of real concern in terms of groundwater recharge is the central Hawke's Bay, so the sort of where the Ruatanifa Dam will be supplying water to. Uh, they've 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 had a they've had a reasonable amount of rain in the last ten days to two weeks. They got about. 50 to 60 millimetres last week when Auckland and the Bay of Plenty got, got hammered. 
so they picked up about 50 or 60 millimeters in. They had about 10 to 10 to 20 millimeters the week before. So they, they're somewhere between 70 and 80 millimeters. So that's a that's the sort of rainfall that's that's pretty useful at this time of the year to give them some to give that that area, that Ruatanifa Basin area, some um, some groundwater recharge. But of course, it never it never made it here. It was it was all northerly and northeasterly rain, and the and the system swept across the top of the North Island, and then disappeared out to go and see somebody else in the Pacific, and didn't make its way down to the to the east coast of the of the South Island. Well, you've spent hours and hours doing a, a graph. Let's have a look at the graph. <laughs> yeah, so um, I've I've talked about this to to an, to some other groups already about, and it's and it's a real concern because if you look at the blue trace that's on this this. This is water level for a bore, one of the monitor bores in the middle of the plains, sort of halfway between yep. the coast and the mountains. And, and the pink area is where we have problems when the water levels get really low. So these are, these are when we have so problems. So the, the pink levels are basically the, the, the low area. Yeah. yeah, and so what I did was I, I, I decided I'd look at what rainfall we needed in that period from about the middle of April through to the to about the 1st of August, because if we don't get rainfall recharge by then, we could be into the irrigation season and starting to take water that, that hasn't quite got to the groundwater system yet. And so the bars, the black ones and the red ones, are, are, um, show us the, the amount of rain we've had in, in some of the previous seasons in, those, in, those, in that period of time. So that's the black ones? They're the black ones, and the red ones show that, that same rainfall. So the black ones, in this case, are good, not bad. <laughs> um, because if you look at them carefully, then the, the, the groundwater, the next season following that, is high. So we get real big peaks in the, in the, in the, uh, in the water level and therefore the volume of water that's available for, for irrigators and towns and domestic supplies. Uh, so this affects ev this affects everybody. It's not just about the water for groundwater for irrigation because if we get really low groundwater levels, uh, then it affects people's ability to get domestic water and stock water. Mm. So it, it, it affects right across the board. This is not just about, about irrigation. And then when you look at the red bars that are on this, on this plant, then those are the years when we haven't had enough rainfall to give us substantial recharge or any recharge to the groundwater system. And, and that's what we've got now. And that's what we've got now. And right now we have the lowest... Uh, rainfall recharge or rainfall available for recharge since in this in this case since about 1984 uh, 1974 so um, you know this is this is pretty serious you know we've got 30 odd years of, of of record in here and this is the lowest in the 30 years that we've had so far and farmers will tell you and those people that are involved in the land that these things come in sequences you don't get one and then then get relief the next year. When you get droughts, for example, you get one and then invariably it gets followed up by another one. And it's the one that gets followed up, the follow-up one is the serious one because you can you can get through that first one. Yeah. The second one's hard to get through. And the third one is... Devastating. Exactly. This yeah. is going back to the 1980s, isn't it? Oh, yeah, yeah. But you can, you can find that same... The same pattern occurs in some of the... If you go back to some of the bores where we've had we've got records from the 50s. We can find this pattern all the way back through to the 50s. So you get periods where we have very little rainfall recharge or very low rainfall during that winter recharge period. And then we get this without any irrigation in those days or any takes out of these, out of any takes yeah. of any sort. Yeah. The water levels just get lower and lower and lower and lower. In fact, some of the very lowest water levels were recorded back in the early 1960s. And there was no, virtually no irrigation at all in those days. So it, it's not a it's not a result necessarily of, of irrigation, although that has exacerbated the problem a little bit now. It's the fact that we do not get these rainfall recharge events that we need during the winter. Tony, please keep coming in so we can monitor. Thank you very much indeed. If you'd like to have another look at that graph and study it a bit more, of course, you can go to our website, which is ontheland.co.nz. In fact, you can see all our items that were on this week's programme. I'm Rob Cope Williams. You've either been watching or you've just missed the programme and a damn good interview with Tony. In the meantime, take care now. Bye.